gas are a large group of man-made chemicals known as per- and polyfluoroalkyl substances. They've been around since the 1940s and they have very useful properties that make them very popular to use in many consumer items. We're concerned about PFAS because recent studies have shown that there could be health effects for humans and to the environment. PFAS are very soluble compounds and then once they get into the environment, they are very stable and they don't biodegrade easily. Because of that, over the time, they do accumulate in the water bodies, uh, increasing their concentrations. PFAS is a challenge to remove from drinking water because they're persistent and they can be difficult to detect. Currently, we don't have a good understanding how many PFAS compounds are being used by the industry. That makes it challenging for us in terms of measuring them and then creating data set that can help us to treat PFAS compounds. We can effectively measure maybe 30 to 50 of these compounds, but uh, in literature, we know that there are uh, over several thousands of these compounds that are being used in the industry. And EPA recently announced its intention to regulate PFAS compounds. And uh, if it is regulated, utilities will be required to measure them and then also remove them from the uh, drinking water sources. When we think about PFAS as a fast evolving or emerging topic, that's a considerable understatement. It's so much regulation that's coming on PFAS, they're gonna have big impacts on communities, both in terms of cost and in terms of ensuring safety of their water resources. There's need for research around analytical techniques, around treatment techniques, around ways to keep PFAS out of water resources in the first place. That's the key to making sure that communities are safe. In terms of PFAS treatment, we looked at the conventional treatment and then some other technologies to treat PFAS. And the three technologies that are coming on top currently are granulated activated carbon, GAC, ion exchange and the membranes. Uh, those three technologies can effectively remove PFAS. However, one technology that may work for one source may not work for another source. Our ultimate goal is to destroy the PFAS molecule by breaking the chemical bond between fluorine and carbon so that it does not continue the cycle. PFAS aren't just a problem for drinking water, they're a problem for other parts of the water cycle as well. PFAS can enter wastewater treatment plant and be incorporated into the biosolids, which then may be applied to the land for beneficial uses. In certain states, the application of biosolids has been banned. Almost 55% of the biosolids generated by wastewater treatment plants are land applied. We've been looking at PFAS occurrence in biosolid and understand the stability of PFAS within the biosolid environment. So the, our research is looking at how quickly PFAS can be released uh, from biosolids or when biosolids are applied to the land, what happens to PFAS compounds within, within those uh, biosolids. And finally, uh, one important research that we are looking at also, communication to the public. If these PFAS compounds are measured by utilities, it will be important for utilities to really communicate what does it mean for their consumers. One of the things we can be certain of regarding PFAS is that water utilities are gonna face significant challenges for the foreseeable future. The Water Research Foundation has been and will continue to be at the forefront of PFAS research, making sure we understand how to keep these compounds out of our water resources, how to detect if they're present there, and how to treat them, both in terms of drinking water, but also in terms of solids management, to have a comprehensive view with our water utilities on how to maximize protection of the public they serve.